<clears throat> this is uh, the sixth day of this September 2021 seven day session. And the first day that we are all free of masks, our COVID masks. If uh, the recording of this Tay show is still around and in the future, that this uh, notation will be a kind of a marker of a historical marker of a terrible, terrible time in our in our world history. Uh, we'll take one more dip into uh, the teachings of Yuan Wu from the book called Zen Letters, translated by J.C. Cleary and Thomas Cleary. Uh, I wanted to mention that uh, Yuan Wu and his disciple Da Wei, whose biography we read from on day one, uh, they're, 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 they distinguish themselves by uh, having included women among their Dharma heirs, which was uh, evidently a, a exceedingly rare thing at the time. To us, it's the most natural thing uh, that women would not be excluded, but in 12th century China, this was uh, just about unheard of. <clears throat> and start a new letter here. He says, The essential thing in practicing the way is to make the roots deep and the stem strong. The roots, or the root, uh, is not just zazen. That's a that's a um, perfect embodiment of the root. But uh, more broadly, uh, the realm of no mind, which is something we can extend out, out from the sitting, out from our the zendo. When he talks about making the, the roots deep, I mean, just uh, always fortifying this, this uh, channel into uh, an empty mind, a mind unshackled to thoughts. Roots deep and the stem strong. I'm not sure how you distinguish the roots from the stem. Be aware of where you really are 24 hours a day. This is uh, no small thing. Most people are divided. They're doing one thing and their mind is somewhere else. Their body is in one place, maybe moving, maybe still. Their mind is somewhere else. Because their mind is somewhere else, they're not aware. So it's a tall order. Be aware of where you really are 24 hours a day. So I... Uh, a cartoon in a, uh, a Vipassana periodical, Vipassana Buddhist periodical. It showed uh, someone watching TV, and the, on the screen, uh, there was just a, a, a single message, where is your mind? <laughs> oh, that would be... Worth, in, worth watching TV for that. <laughs> you must be most attentive. Yeah, you must be, but that it's, it doesn't come easily. We're so habituated to, to having our mind wander and not knowing it's wandering. This is the, 
the, the, the basic challenge is to notice when it's wandering. We're so attached to our random thoughts that we need to get lost in them. So to say you must be, yeah, but uh, how do we get there? Through sitting. It's through sitting that we develop this greater ability, <clears throat> still not perfect, but we're more likely, the more sitting we do, the more likely we are to notice soon, sooner when the mind is wandering. Because if your mind is lost in thoughts, it doesn't matter if you've been told, you must be aware. When nothing at all sticks to your mind, it all merges harmoniously, without boundaries. The whole thing is empty and still, and there is no more doubt or hesitation in anything you do. This is called the fundamental matter appearing ready-made. <clears throat> they have this uh, this convention in... Uh, in Chinese texts, at least the Chan text, Zen text, of uh, uh, presenting what something is called. You see this all the time. We'll see it probably even today, just a little further into this text. <clears throat> they stop and they say, this is called the fundamental matter appearing ready-made, or whatever it is. They seem to really value getting a label for things. There's no more doubt or hesitation in anything you do. Uh, uh, doubt, of course, is a thought. Uh, or a cluster of thoughts in the mind. And, uh, and thoughts tend to uh, obstruct us in our responses, in our actions. Here, too, uh, to the awareness, the, the, the fundamental importance of awareness uh, in, 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 the, in when we are beset by doubts. And, of course, they come at us in Sashin. Uh, to be aware right there in, in the barrage of doubts, to be aware that they're thoughts and nothing more. There's never been a doubt other than as a thought. And if you can just have the presence of mind, you say, whoa, 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 all right. Uh, this voice, this doubting voice that tells me that I'm not up for the task, I'm not as good as others, or I don't have it in me, it's a thought. It's nothing but a thought. Why would we put any stock in a thought. Yes, thoughts have their place, of course. Thoughts inspire um, acts of, of creation and, and um, ways of solving problems, but that's not what we're talking about. Doubt about oneself, that's that has, that's, so I say all the time, doubts are not your friends. As the thoughts are not your friends. Same thing. <clears throat> he continues, as soon as you give rise to the slightest bit of dualistic perception or arbitrary understanding, and you want to take charge of this fundamental matter and act the master, then you immediately fall into the realm of the clusters of form, sensation, conception, 
value synthesis and consciousness. Okay, okay, those are the five skandhas. That's that's the the Cleary brothers' translation of the five skandhas, the five components of uh, individual personhood. Uh, we say them in the Prajnaparamita back in the before times when we chanted the Prajnaparamita uh, with uh, fe- form, feeling, thought, and choice, and consciousness. Those are loose renderings because they're, they're simple words, re- relatively simple. Uh, our form is our body, sensation, obvious, uh, conception or thought, a value synthesis. That's the first time I've seen that translation. It means volition, uh, uh, the, or choice that gives rise to uh, patterns, karma. And then the last of the five is consciousness. <clears throat> so back to what he started. Uh, as, soon as, as soon as you... You want to take charge of this fundamental matter and act the master. Then you succumb to this notion of a self. He's saying, don't be deceived uh, by the illusion of control. We have some degree of control in terms of where we direct our, atten- our attention, where we choose to direct our attention. Uh, but don't, we can't imagine that we're the boss of the mind. Uh, this is where uh, will, the idea of will, has its limits. Yes, it's good to have a strong intention, can come from vows, but uh, don't we can't deceive ourselves into thinking that there's some kind of a, a self here, some big shot who can control things and have his or her way. The mind has other other things on its agenda. And that's why what we want to do is turn turn it over to this true mind, this no mind, that's, that's where we get out of the way. That's where things open up. To the degree that we can surrender, we can turn it over to mu, to the breath, to whatever koan one is working on, to that degree we will be empowered. Then we don't have to rely on um, some boss who is uh, directing things. It's a, it's a it's a sensitive point. We 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 need to have uh, to make effort. We need to be clear about what what we want in terms of you know thoughts or no thoughts. Uh, but then there comes a point where. We have to yield to this this mind of wisdom, this bodhi mind that is beyond thought, beyond uh, even uh, designs, beyond uh, agenda, beyond desire. You are entrapped by seeing, hearing, feeling, and knowing that is the, the six senses, by gain and loss and right and wrong and all other, we could say, all other conceptual, dualistic conceptions. You are half drunk and half sober and unable to clean all this up. How intoxicated we are with our thoughts. God, we, if, 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 if before we come to Sashin, we don't know what we're up against, we find out, as Sashin goes on, the tenacity of this discriminating mind. 
this illusion of selfhood, this the I, the me, and the my, how determined it is to maintain control. He continues, Frankly speaking, you simply must manage to keep concentrating concentrating even in the midst of clamor and tumult, acting as though there were not a single thing happening, penetrating all the way through from the heights to the depths, concentrating even in the midst of clamor and tumult, even in, when, in the zendo when it's noisiest, even in a crowded, bustling airport, even in a busy intersection, in the midst of traffic and honking horns. We have this capacity. We must, must find this out in, in Sashin to, uh, to keep ourselves uh, through the, 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 the strength of our, of our focused attention to keep ourselves, as uh, Emerson said, enclosed in the tumultuous privacy of storm. Maybe wrapped with everything around us uh, in a commotion, but we have this ability to find this, uh, the eye of the hurricane in, in, through our own, the way we use the mind. You must become perfectly complete without any shapes or forms at all, without wasting effort, yet not inhibited from acting. Whether you speak or stay silent, whether you get up or lie down, it is never anyone else. It is no no self-consciousness. When he says without any shapes or forms, of course he means without uh, attaching to uh, what in, in Buddhist text is called name and form. If you become aware of getting it all stuck or blocked, this is all false thought at work. This is a very common experience, of course. Went through it so many times myself where we feel like we're up against a, a wall or a boulder, or some uh, immovable object in the koan. Uh, it's an illusion. Where, where is there an object there? Where is there anything concrete? Just false thought, he says. And thought is something that we can work our way through by not attending to it. Make yourself completely untrammeled, like empty space, like a clear mirror on its stand, like the rising sun lighting up the sky. Moving or still, going or coming, it doesn't come from outside. Is everything is just this one mind. No seams, no inside or outside. Mind. Moo. Let go and make yourself independent and free, not being bound by things and not seeking to escape from things. I 
a saying in Zen, the enlightened person is not bound, nor does she bind. From beginning to end, fuse everything into one whole. Again, language is deceptive. We don't have to make that a project. Okay, we're going to get into fusing now. It's, 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 it's just a matter of complete, rapt, thorough absorption in the practice. That's where the fusing happens. Where has there ever been any separate worldly phenomenon apart from the Buddha Dharma or any separate Buddha Dharma apart from worldly phenomena? Always warning here about this uh, make believing in some dichotomy because of words, believing in a dichotomy between the, the Dharma on the one hand and all this worldly phenomena. This is why the founder of Zen pointed directly to the human mind. This is why the Diamond Sutra taught the importance of human beings detaching from forms. Forms, of course, the, 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 the most troublesome of all forms is thoughts. Thoughts are forms, immaterial forms, detaching from forms. To put it another way, not getting attached to what we see or hear, taste or smell, feel or think about. To develop this essential insight, it is best to spend a long time going back into yourself and investigating with your whole being so that you can arrive at the stage of the genuine experience of enlightenment. This is what it means to practice with boundless, infinite, enlightened teachers everywhere in every moment. That's this realm of no mind. We're free of thoughts. We are... We are receiving the teaching of boundless, infinite, enlightened teachers everywhere and every moment. It describes Mu. It describes the breath. Right there, the breath itself comprises boundless, infinite, enlightened teachers. And we have it available to us everywhere and every moment. It's the marvelous thing about the breath. We're never separate from it. And he closes the letter by saying, Strive sincerely for for true faith and apply yourself diligently to your meditation work. This is the best course for you. How do we strive sincerely for true faith? Isn't that faith a matter of something either we have or we don't in one degree or another? No, that wouldn't be the end of it because faith is a is something we develop. And we develop, how do we do that? We develop faith every time we turn our mind back to the practice we're working on. That's it's a it's a it's a, it's a testimony to our faith, our faith in what is beyond this ordinary mind, this thinking mind. It's, it's, it's an act of faith, and it develops more faith. Because this realm of no mind, of mu, of breath, and so forth, it, it never stops giving. It's, it's, 
without bottom to it. He quotes uh, another great Chinese master, Yanto, Japanese, Japanese name Ganto. Abandoning things is superior, pursuing things is inferior. You know, he's a, he's a, uh, Yuan Wu, the, the author of these letters, he's a, he's a monk. And as a monk, uh, he's made this, he's renounced the world. Uh, but this is, these are words we can still uh, use, we householders, abandoning things, starting with thoughts. If your own state is empty and tranquil, perfectly illuminated and silently shining, then you will be able to confront whatever circumstances impinge on you with the indestructible sword of wisdom and cut everything off, everything from the myriad entangling objects to the verbal teachings of the past and present. Then your awesome, chilling spirit cuts off everything and everything retreats of itself without having to be pushed away without having to be pushed away. Very important. Never do we want to push anything out of the mind. Zen practice is beyond reject, rejection of anything. If the basis you establish is not clear... If you are the least bit bogged down in hesitation and doubt, there's that word again, then you will be dragged off by entangling conditions and obviously you will not be able to separate yourself from them. How can you avoid being turned around by other things? When you are following other things, you will never have any freedom. Yeah, the great Linji, Rinzai, said a moment of doubt in your heart is Mara. Mara, Mara is sort of the, just to keep it simple, sort of the Buddhist devil, Buddhist Satan. Uh, and uh, But from a Zen perspective, uh, that's Mara, a moment of doubt in your heart, giving way, giving way to doubts. Another way of understanding Mara, another Buddhist way, is uh, Mara has access to us wherever we're attached. Just going back to this earlier in this paragraph where he's a uh, ganto, he quotes Ganto, abandoning things is superior. Um, and he says, this, in doing this, you'll be able to confront whatever circumstances impinge on you. So, to be clear, um, this is a, a way of, of uh, functioning more effectively. This not, not attaching to, uh, to just random irrelevant thoughts. Uh, not... not not uh, getting bogged down in what Roshi Kappa used to call thoughting. There's nothing wrong with thinking. Thinking is a great endowment we have as human beings to solve problems and find our way through the world. But thoughting, just being awash in thoughts of the future and the past and every fantasies, this is, does not heighten our functioning in the world. It's being free of that abandoning those that stuff when we don't need to use this 
marvelous discriminating mind. Next letter. Round and clear, empty and still, such is the essence of the way. Extending and withdrawing, killing and bringing life, such is its marvelous function. So here, uh, contrasting the two, the two aspects of mind. One is the essence, clear, empty, still, and the other is the function, the activity. He says killing and bringing to life. And understand this is uh, whenever we, we uh, detach from thoughts, we're killing this self-centered mind wrapped around I, me, and my, and bringing to life this true self of ours. When you are able to travel on the sword's edge, when you are able to persevere and hold on, when you are like a pearl rolling around in a bowl, like a bowl rolling a pearl around inside it, when you never fall into empty vanity, even for an instant, when you never divide worldly phenomena from the Buddha Dharma, but fuse them into one whole, this is called meeting it wherever you touch. Boy, there's a lot packed in here. When you're able to travel on the sword's edge, I mean, I mean being, being fully present. And this, uh, this razor's edge of neither the past nor the future, but right here, right here, and here, and again, the present only. A sword's edge. When you are like a pearl rolling around in a bowl, like a bowl rolling a pearl around inside it. No, no, none of the sharp corners and sharp edges of our emotional afflictions, our personality issues, adapting, responding to things. Be breathing and being breathed. Clouds and water adapting to circumstances as they change, moving along with things, not setting ourselves against things, against people. When you never fall into empty vanity, I'm just take that as just our our root self centeredness, even for an instant. He goes on, you appear and disappear and move freely in all directions and there is never anything external. You are clean and naked, turning smoothly, sealing everything with a fundamental. It is clear everywhere, complete in everything. When has there ever been gain and loss or affirmation and denial or good and evil, or long and short. Clean and naked, um, without affectation, without duplicity, without uh, scheming for uh, self-aggrandizement, without scheming to 
to get it to uh, feed the self. The verbal teachings of the Buddhas and ancestral teachers are just a snare and a trap. They are used as a means of entry into truth. Once you have opened through into clear enlightenment and taken it up, then in the true essence, everything is complete. Then you look upon all the verbal teachings of the Buddhas and ancestral teachers as belonging to the realm of shadows and echoes so you never carry them around in your head. This is just classic Zen, classic teaching of the Zen school. Beware words. You can so easily become bewitched by words. There are two... uh, Earlier masters, uh, Chinese masters, Guishan and Yangshan, where Guishan said, "In the forty rolls of the Maha, in the forty rolls of the Maha Nirvana Sutra, some highly esteemed sutra, how many words are the Buddhas and how many the demons?" And Yangshan said, "All words belong to the demons." In Zen, it's not the words, it's what's behind the words. It's the spirit of the words. It's the understanding or lack of understanding behind the words. So he he elaborates a little bit. He says, having mind and having no mind, having views and having no views, both alternatives vanish like a snowflake put on a red-hot stove. Just bring this to complete purity and ripeness, and you will naturally become a true person beyond study and free from contrived activity, a true person whom thousands and tens of thousands of people cannot trap or cage. Trap or cage in in words, for example. When he says, bring this to complete purity and ripeness, it takes time. The longer we are at this, the, the, the more we see how much further there is to go. Zen Master Hakuin said, uh, the Dharma is like the sea. Uh, the further you get into it, the deeper it gets. Absolutely true. One little bit more. He says, for the sake of this great teaching, the ancients gave up their bodies and their lives and endured endless, immeasurable hardship and toil 
until they thoroughly clarified its profound, essential message. It's an ironclad law of life, isn't it? The more we put into it, the more we'll get out of it. And nothing of, of real value is done easily. Nothing of real value can be done except through long time. The stage of Sashin, when we're we're uh, up against still some resistance about, say, staying up at doing extra sitting at night. We have to f- somehow find the faith. It comes down to faith, really. Faith in our nature, faith in this, this mind that is beyond our discriminating mind, That's, that we, we access through the, the koan or the breath. But it takes effort. I love uh, what William James said. It is only by risking our persons from one hour to another that we live at all. Beyond the very extremity of fatigue and distress, we may find amounts of ease and power we never dreamed ourselves to own, sources of strength never taxed at all because we never push through the obstruction. We are all stronger than we think we are. This is what uh, Roshi Kaplow, Philip Kaplow at the time, after spending a a night in a little hut in the monastery in Japan where uh, his dear mentor, one of the monks, uh, was using the stick on him through the night and the last night of Sashin to help him break through final barrier uh, he was one of the one of the defining experiences of his Zen career uh, he talks about it in one of his books uh, at the end when they heard the tolling of the bell the signal the morning sitting they turned to each other they bowed you can be sure that there was just inexpressible Gratitude and mutual respect there. And uh, Tangan Roshi said to him, Kaplo san, you're stronger than you think. We all are. There's nothing Kaplo san had that we don't have in our true self. We can all do this. We can all go deeper, endlessly deeper. If we, if we have the faith, the faith. We'll stop now and recite the four vows. <laughs> 